Almost 20 years ago, during the early 2000s, two teams in the north of England built enormous state-of-the-art stadiums in relation to the level of football they played at. These two teams, namely Hull City and Darlington, both competed in the old third division at the time, now known as League Two, and both were building all-seater stadiums capable of holding 25,000 people, making them among the largest football stadiums in England outside of the Premier League. Hull City moved into their new ground, the KC Stadium, midway through the 2002-03 campaign, a season that they would end just one place above Darlington. In fact, in the Tigers' final game at their old home ground, Boothbury Park, they were beaten 1-0 by Darlington in an underwhelming farewell to a once great, but now deeply decrepit old ground. Darlington Stadium move came just eight months later, right at the start of the 2003-04 campaign, as they played their first game at the Reynolds Arena. Over the next decade, Hull City's new ground helped propel the club to heights they had never previously reached. Three promotions in five seasons secured one of the fastest ascents from English football's basement division to the Premier League in the history of the English game, and the Casey Stadium would be packed to the rafters in English football's top flight every week. Darlington's new stadium did little to lift the Quakers' fortunes. Darlington performed worse in their first season after moving to their new ground than they had done the previous year in their old one, and they would go on to taste two relegations, finishing bottom of League 2, and being dumped out of the conference, without tasting a single promotion in their grand new establishment. Instead, the cost of erecting this monument to human stupidity would cost the club not just their football league status, but also their very existence. Three months ago, the man behind Darlington's enormous, baffling white elephant of a stadium, George Reynolds, died at the age of 84. Reynolds was many different things to many different people and at many different times. To some, he was simply a crook. To others, a saviour. Reynolds has been described as a gangster, a character, a criminal, a hero, a villain, and pretty much everything in between. So in today's video, we're heading to the northeast of England, to a town that was once home to the world's first permanent steam locomotive-powered passenger railway, in an attempt to unpick the truth behind a man who genuinely used to unpick locks and blast open safes for a living, to try and make sense of one of the most bizarre football stadiums ever built, and to examine the legacy that both he and it have left behind. For 120 years, there was only one place that Darlington Football Club called home, and that was Feetham's. Amateur football had actually been played on the site of the historic ground as early as the 1860s, but it was in 1883, at the same time that Darlington Football Club was founded, that it became a more structured sporting venue. Before the football club arrived, immediately adjacent to the site of the football stadium, was a cricket field, which remained following the football club's arrival. That gave Feetums the unusual quirk of football fans entering through the turnstiles and then having to walk all the way around a cricket field before reaching either their seats or their position on the terraces. Feetums was also famous for the fact that it was very easy for supporters to make their way around the ground, and given that there was typically no lack of space, supporters would often swap seats or standing positions at half-time in order to be behind or closer to the goal that Darlington were attacking. In 1907, the England Amateur National Football Team, which was a separate entity to the actual England team, beat the Netherlands 12-2 at Feetums in front of a packed-out crowd. Though the FA don't consider this to have been an official England international, because it was England's amateur team, the Dutch FA do consider it to have been a full Netherlands international, meaning that it is officially the heaviest defeat that the Netherlands has ever suffered, and it took place in Darlington. The stadium's more regular tenants, Darlington FC, were founding members of the Northern League, before joining the Football League in 1921. The club's finest achievement within the league game would arrive shortly after that, in the 1924-25 season, when they won the 3rd Division North title, winning promotion to English football's second tier, where they would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of the Wednesday, Derby County, and Chelsea as equals. Darlington survived for one season before dropping back down into the 3rd Division North, where they remained until the creation of a nationwide 4th Division. Darlington lost their league status for the first time in the 1988-89 season, 
when the club was facing significant financial difficulties before former Aston Villa striker and England international Brian Little came along to turn their fortunes around. Little guided the Quakers to back-to-back -back promotions, earning himself a job at Leicester City, but as soon as he left, Darlington were relegated again, back down into English football's fourth tier, which had been newly renamed as the third division due to the breakaway of the Premier League from the Football League over that same summer. Darlington came close to securing a return to the third tier, then known as the second division, and now League One, when they reached a playoff final in 1996. But they suffered a narrow 1-0 defeat to a Plymouth Argyle side managed by Neil Warnock at the old Wembley Stadium, in front of 43,431 fans. By the summer of 1999, just three years later, Darlington were on the brink. The club had debts totalling several million pounds and absolutely no ability to meet those obligations. The threat was existential, but out of nowhere arrived a saviour with a broad northeast accent, a large Rolls Royce, and a colourful past to give it its respectable title. A man who described himself as being a combination of Richard Branson, Brian Clough, and Norman Stanley Fletcher, the last of those being the inmate protagonist portrayed by Ronnie Barker in the prison-based UK sitcom Porridge, for those of you who don't know, Reynolds claimed to have a net worth of £300 million, and he arrived with some pretty bold plans for the struggling fourth-tier outfit. And yes, that is Oprah alongside him. On day one, Reynolds paid off the club's debts, claiming to have done so by writing a cheque that was worth more than £5 million. Also on day one, Reynolds laid out his three-point plan for the club, which he hoped to achieve within the space of just five years. The first aim was to pay off the club's debts, and then not to incur any further debts throughout the course of his tenure. The second, which raised one or two eyebrows, was to build a 25,000-seater stadium, and the third, which provoked mild amusement more than any other response, was to get Darlington into the Premier League. Reynolds' stadium plans were largely dismissed as being first a bravado to impress the press present at his inauguration. Yeah, I know, easy for me to say. Darlington were in need of a new stadium. Following 120 years at Feetums, whatever the emotional attachment, few fans denied that the old ground had seen better days. Despite attempted renovations in 1997, the club was fighting a losing battle, and if they hadn't been so cash-strapped, it is likely a previous administration would have been exploring new sites. The problem at Feetums wasn't so much the crumbling infrastructure, but more the perennially waterlogged pitch, which was rendered virtually unplayable throughout the wetter winter months. Reynolds didn't back down from his promises in the coming weeks, though, maintaining that he would build, well, sometimes a 25,000, sometimes a 27,000-seater stadium, and reach the summit of the English game. Reynolds' wife, Susan, declared upon his arrival at the club that failure is not a word in George's vocabulary. Apparently, nor was reality. Reynolds' bold plan was built upon the supposition that he could replicate what he had done in the kitchen worktop business, his most lucrative business venture, within the world of football. Though he claimed a net worth of, well, again, sometimes 275 million, sometimes 300 million pounds, Plenty of people disputed that figure, and suspected that it may be rather fanciful. Reynolds was certainly a very wealthy man at that time though, having just sold a sizable stake in his kitchen worktop business for £32.2 million, which many believed to be the bulk of whatever his real net worth actually was. Reynolds had taken the kitchen worktop sector by storm by pricing his worktops at 50% of the price of his competition without compromising, or so he claimed, on quality. It proved to be a big success, as the tycoon hoovered up a significant percentage of market share, and Reynolds said that he could do the same in football. His plan, as he outlined it, was to offer the cheapest tickets in the Football League, starting at £5 and going up to £10 for adults, depending on position within the ground, and freezing those prices, regardless of inflation, demand, or which league Darlington were playing in, for at least the next 20 years. This, he hoped, would attract at least 15,000 fans to Darlington, 10,000 either existing or neutral fans from within Darlington and its catchment area, by which 
I think he meant the 300,000 plus odd people with Darlington postcodes, along with an additional 5,000 football fans that he hoped to attract from Middlesbrough, Sunderland and Newcastle United. Reynolds stated, upon his arrival in 1999, after outlining these plans and comparing football to his kitchen worktop business that, quote, People keep on saying to me that football's different, but it's not different, end quote. Spoiler alert, it is different. I'm sure most of you already know this, but just in case, people tend to be more attached to, say, Sunderland or Newcastle United Football Club than they are to a more expensive brand of kitchen worktop before you offer them a cheaper alternative. This, apparently, was news to George Reynolds. At this point, it's probably worth just talking a little bit about George Reynolds himself, as a character, his past, and how he amassed such a large fortune, even if not potentially quite as large as he claimed, by the late 1990s. Reynolds had a tough upbringing. Born in Sunderland's Dock Street East in 1936, Reynolds' early childhood came during the midst of World War II, where Sunderland was subject to intense bombing campaigns by the Luftwaffe. The war ended when Reynolds was nine years old, but at the age of eight, he had been put up for orphanage. Reynolds remained in an orphanage from the age of eight through to 16 at an orphanage that doubled up as a workhouse. When, at the age of 16, illiterate and with no support network, Reynolds walked out into the world as an adult, he walked straight into a life of crime. It was steal or starve at that age, as Reynolds put it. His first major criminal venture, following a few years stealing cigarettes and smuggling watches, involved buying a Mr. Softy ice cream van and using it to smuggle gelignite, an explosive substance used for safe cracking. Reynolds wasn't bringing in the gelignite for someone else, he blew up the safes himself. This landed Reynolds in a bit of trouble in his mid to late 20s when he was arrested in jail for four years for safe cracking, handling explosives, burglary, and theft. Reynolds described his first stint in prison as having been a blessing since, as an inmate, he came into contact with a priest who convinced him to study, and Reynolds finally learnt to read and write. Reynolds described himself as being a changed man upon his release, though he had made quite a lot of money whilst on the inside, by selling contraband. Nonetheless, following his four-year stint, Reynolds did establish some legitimate businesses, including fruit machines, fitting nightclubs and bars, and of course, his kitchen worktop business. He did go back to prison briefly in 1970 for burglary, and then again in 1976 for theft, but during the 1990s, Reynolds did start to generate significant cash flow, making him a very wealthy person particularly following his £40 million plus exit in the late 1990s. As someone who had genuinely come from nothing, Reynolds certainly wasn't the type to hide his wealth. He wore large diamond rings and Rolex watches, he had a fleet of luxury cars including a Mercedes, a Range Rover and a Rolls Royce, and he even bought a house opposite the Spice Girls in London along with a luxury villa in Marbella. His primary residence was undoubtedly Reynolds' most lavish though, as he bought a great big stately home in County Durham, lived in it for a few years with his first wife, then they divorced, he remarried, and his new wife complained that the mansion stirred too many memories of his ex, so he knocked the entire thing down and rebuilt Witten Hall at a cost of £7 million. Reynolds and his second wife Susan supposedly travelled around the world in order to furnish their not-so-humble abode, once spending £1 million on interiors in a single afternoon at Harrods. Oh, I almost forgot to mention the £2 million helicopter, the private jet, and luxury super yacht, the ultimate ways to travel, and ultimate swinging dick, of the rich and famous. If you're struggling to form an accurate representation of Mr Reynolds in your head, then how about the story that in his first week as Darlington's owner and chairman, he paid off the mortgages of seven employees and bought them all brand new Mercedes? There are a myriad of other such tales about George Reynolds, and there are plenty of people who would testify that he was extremely generous, kind, and warm-hearted. There is a danger, however, and one that I am reluctant to fall into, of painting Reynolds as some kind of lovable rogue. You know, sure. He cracked a few safes and nicked a few watches in his time, but he also paid off some mortgages. This would be a mistake, I think. 
Many in the Northeast would tell you that there was very little that they personally found lovable about George Reynolds. Aside from the crimes he was convicted of, Reynolds has been accused by many of using tactics of bullying and intimidation in order to get his own way, whether that be through threatening to turn up at your house during the night or, you know, actually turning up at your house in the middle of the night. Normally, I would be worried about making these kinds of statements, especially about the dead, if they were just flimsy allegations. But not only are there several of them, including some by journalists in the Northeast, who fell on the wrong side of Reynolds by writing unflattering words about him, he actually admitted as much himself, boasting of how he'd go and visit people at their homes at 20 past 2 in the morning, and that they wouldn't want anything to do with him after that. At one point, Reynolds actually warned Darlington fans that he would go around to their houses if they were to criticise him or his family, and he told them to, quote, expect confrontation. He even banned a 16-year-old fanzine editor from attending games because he felt his write-ups were too critical. All things told, and despite his legitimate business successes, Reynolds remained what my granddad would call a rogue. Mind you, my granddad did call every other person that he ever met a rogue, but I think his instincts in this case would be correct. Darlington fans never doubted that Reynolds was somewhat fanciful in his thinking and expectations, they knew that he was a man of vanity and criminality who was full of bluff and bluster, and those who had poor experiences with Reynolds in a business capacity took a particularly dim view of him. But in 1999, when he arrived at the club, most were still excited, and who can blame them? You have to remember, Darlington were headed for extinction when Reynolds arrived, so if he was a bit bonkers, that was fine by most so long as he did what was best for the club. With the debts paid off, a promise of no further debt, the club having been brought into Reynolds' successful business empire, and him being one of, if not the, wealthiest owner in the third division, few would have swapped Reynolds for Darlington's previous predicament. Whilst talk of promotion to the Premier League, which Reynolds was obsessed with, was mostly laughed off, promotion from the third division was not. Darlington went from having 610 season ticket holders the season before Reynolds arrived to 2,800 ahead of the 1999-2000 campaign. An incredible 7,000 replica shirts were sold during the off-season, and Darlington were installed by the bookies as 5-1 favourites to win promotion. For most of the season, Darlington occupied the automatic promotion places. But on the final day of the season, they dropped down into fourth, consigning the club to the lottery of the playoffs. Local rivals Hartlepool were comfortably dispatched in the semi-finals before another trip to the old Wembley Stadium to face Peter Bury United for a spot in the second division. The game was moved from the Saturday afternoon to the Friday night to make space for a friendly game between England and Brazil, making the game incredibly difficult for Darlington fans to attend. Issues that were exacerbated by the awful weather conditions. Constant heavy rain left the Wembley surface not much better than the one at Feetham's, and despite dominating the game, Darlington failed to capitalise, losing 1-0 to Peterborough, who scored from virtually their own attack. This ought to have been a disappointing finish to a generally pretty positive debut campaign. Darlington had clearly made great strides, and they were well placed to win promotion the following season. Instead of taking that measured view of the situation, Reynolds decided that he had been paying too much attention to what other people had to say, and that that had cost the club promotion. And now, he was going to do things his own way. His wife, Susan, became increasingly involved in the club, not always with the most welcome of interventions. At the very first Darlington FC Supporters Club meeting, with the players present, Susan stood up to give a speech in which she accused the Darlington players of throwing games. The players walked out to the rapturous applause of the fans present. The situation was still recoverable, but in reality, this would be the beginning of the end. Reynolds publicly accused the Darlington players of being greedy, and even went so far as to have their wages published in the local newspaper, The Northern Echo. The salaries revealed that Darlington's players were very well remunerated by third division standards, particularly in terms of their bonuses but the players, unsurprisingly, weren't best pleased about that information being put into the public domain. 
Darlington's four-star men from the previous season, including top scorer Marco Gabbiadini, who had scored a whopping 27 goals, all departed, and the rest of the squad were left feeling rather demoralised. Consequently, the following season was an absolute disaster. Darlington finished just four points above the bottom of the league, only narrowly, avoiding relegation to the conference, and attendances slumped back down to almost pre-Reynolds levels, despite being the cheapest tickets in all the Football League. The club's attendances had risen from 3,180 on average to 5,523 under Reynolds in his debut campaign, but they flatlined at around 3,800 for the next two seasons as Darlington recorded consecutive bottom half finishes. This was a big problem for both Reynolds and for Darlington, who were in the process of building one of the largest stadiums outside of the Premier League, which he had hoped would be at least 60% full. Before we come to Reynolds' ill-fated solution to fix that particular problem, I really have to address the elephant in the room. Anyone who builds a 25,000-seater football stadium in Darlington isn't all there in the head. Even if virtually every other aspect of Reynolds' wildly delusional five-year plan had come to fruition, Darlington still wouldn't have been able to fill a 25,000-seater stadium or even have come remotely close, except perhaps for the odd game against the likes of Liverpool and Manchester United. To think that they could do so against Torquay United and Halifax Town is to have lost all touch with reality. It is pure, unadulterated insanity of a kind you may more typically expect to find in someone who has suffered a particularly traumatic accident involving a barbecue skewer which has penetrated their skull and removed 95% of their brain function, leaving behind only the 5% that comes up with increasingly ludicrous ideas and not a single bit of the part that tells you to stop being so absolutely remarkably stupid. Anyhow. Back to Mr. Reynolds, and his big plan to get bums on seats ahead of the big move. His genius solution to unlock the 21,000 fans Darlington needed to find from somewhere was to sign a big-name marquee signing that would get a load of press attention and motivate people to go and see Darlington all on their own. In fairness, it isn't the worst idea in the world, and it has worked for clubs in the past, the issue for Reynolds was the fact that Darlington were a bottom-half team in the fourth tier of the English game. Undeterred, in the summer of 2001, Reynolds went on an all-out charm offensive to try and sign England legend and one of the North East's most famous sons, Paul Gascoigne. Gazza was contracted to Premier League side Everton at the time, but he had had a rotten time with injuries and it looked as though his time with the Toffees would be coming to an end. That was indeed the case, but... Gascoigne and his agent reportedly felt Reynolds only wanted to sign Paul as a marketing stunt, which was, of course, the case, so they turned Darlington down and Gazza signed for Burnley instead. Next up, if anything, Reynolds turned his attention to an even bolder piece of transfer business, eyeing up former Newcastle United star Tino Espria. The Colombian superstar had already lit up the top tier of English football in the Northeast as well as starring in a fantastic Parma team in Syria. But he too appeared to be out of favour following brief stints in Mexico and in Brazil. His time in Darlington would be even briefer. Reynolds spent seven weeks trying to sign Espria, offering him a contract reported to be worth an eye-watering £17,000 a week, which would be unthinkable in League 2 now, let alone 20 years ago, along with an apartment and some other temptations. At one point, Reynolds must have presumed that he had his man, giving interviews alongside him with Sky Sports and parading him around Feetums before kickoff in a game. Aspria was actually listed in the Darlington squad in the program notes the following week after being unveiled to fans, since they had to be printed almost a week in advance, despite the fact that by that time, everyone knew the deal had fallen through. Reynolds said he was gutted, meanwhile Aspria said Reynolds had offered him one contract over the phone and a totally different one, and even a different apartment, once he had met him in person. The whole thing contributed to the image of Reynolds and of Darlington as being a desperate mess flailing around waving pound notes in front of players' faces and still getting rejected. A year later, the club went back in for Gascoigne, but failed once again the Italian IT star, instead choosing to head to China. 
when Espria was asked, live on Sky Sports, what he felt of Reynolds' plans to take Darlington to the Premier League, he just started laughing. Perhaps that ought to have been a warning sign. By this point, unsurprisingly, and indeed a fair bit earlier in truth, fans were starting to lose faith in Reynolds. Whilst some remained fearful to publicly criticise him at all due to the repeated threats. Almost all could scarcely believe the club was still pressing ahead with a 25,000-seater stadium. Nonetheless, they did just that. And on August 15th, 2003, Darlington played their first game at the very humbly named Reynolds Arena. This is a man, it should be noted, who named his business George Reynolds UK and had his offices headquartered at the George Reynolds Industrial Park. So, the Reynolds Arena really ought not to have come as much of a shock to anyone, and in truth, it's a wonder that he didn't try to change the team's name to George Reynolds's Quakers. That first game drew an enormous crowd by Darlington standards, as fans flocked from far and wide to see this bizarre venue on the outskirts of the town, which Reynolds described as the best stadium in Europe. The capacity had to be limited for that opening game, as it would always be, due to insufficient parking and public transport accessibility, but 11,600 fans still turned up to see Darlington lose 2-0 against Kidderminster Harriers. The fact that Darlington lost that game and put in such an insipid performance was really the final nail in the coffin of Reynolds' plans to have over 15,000 fans in the ground for anything other than an Elton John concert. Darlington never recorded even half that amount for a home game ever again. Their average attendance for the season following the move rose by less than 2,000, up to just 5,023. That would still be the highest average attendance the club ever managed at the ground, bearing in mind the fact that Feetums itself could accommodate 8,500 fans. In their first season in their new ground, without a marquee signing, and with attendances only having increased very marginally, Darlington finished lower in the third division than they had done the previous season, recording a lowly 18th place finish. It was almost as if the remarkably brain-dead Reynolds Arena wasn't the footballing mecca and silver bullet that the Quakers' resident clown had boldly predicted. Build it and they will come was the mantra, but Reynolds built it and no one came. Well, some people did, but mostly just those that already went, and even then, most of them would soon give up. In their last three seasons at the Reynolds Arena, later renamed the Darlington Arena, and now the Northern Echo Arena, Darlington twice averaged under 2,000 fans in the stadium, and only narrowly eclipsed that figure in the other one. Their lowest league attendances left the stadium roughly 95% empty. Reynolds once boasted that he almost called the stadium the White Elephant, since that's what everyone kept calling it before it was built, and he just loved proving people wrong. Perhaps, if he had done that, people might at least not have remembered which idiot decided to build a 25,000-seater football stadium in Darlington 20 years on. I'm not being very charitable, they definitely would still have remembered, since only one man would be mad enough to do something like that. Following their lowly 18th place finish in their first season in their mammoth, but largely empty new ground, Darlington's on-field performances did actually start to improve, but off the pitch, the club was in chaos. Unbeknownst to most supporters, throughout his time owning the club, Reynolds seemingly wasn't just losing his marbles, but also his vast personal fortune and business empire. Even in the 1999-2000 season, Reynolds' first season owning the club, in which he boasted profits of over £1 million a month at his company, company accounts actually revealed that George Reynolds UK Limited actually lost £2.5 million that year. The following year, the business lost £9 million, but still transferred £1.9 million more over to the football club. That would be the last full financial year in which the business operated, going into liquidation in 2003, owing creditors £3.4 million. When the creditors came in to investigate what exactly had happened at GRUK, they determined that the £7 million Reynolds had put into Darlington, along with the £1.5 million that he transferred to another business that he also owned, was irresponsible at a time when the business was a loss-making enterprise and that it was to the detriment of GRUK's creditors. The conclusion was that the money that Reynolds had put into Darlington was improper, 
and consequently, he was banned from being a director or working in senior management at any company in the United Kingdom for the next eight years. It turned out that Reynolds had actually run out of money whilst building the 25,000-seater Reynolds Arena, and that consequently, to stave off personal bankruptcy, the man who promised never to take on any debt at Darlington had taken a £4 million loan from the Sterling Consortium on behalf of the club to finish the project. In January 2004, just five months after Darlington had moved into the Reynolds Arena, the man himself, George Reynolds, resigned as both chairman and director of the club, amidst pressure from supporters. In doing so, he left Darlington high and dry, needing to find £4 million to repay the loan Reynolds had taken out to build a stadium that no one in Darlington actually wanted. It was as if Reynolds had pardoned Darlington from a death sentence in 1999 and then executed the club himself in 2004. Darlington fans finally got the chance to witness Paul Gascoigne at the Reynolds Arena, ironically, during the same month that Reynolds left the club. Some famous faces, including the likes of Gazza, Chris Waddle, and Kenny Dalgleish, featured in a benefit game to try and raise funds to ensure the survival of the struggling club, who had entered administration before Reynolds resigned and were now facing a winding up order that threatened their very existence. The game saw by far the largest attendance ever witnessed at the stadium for a football match. As over 14,000 fans turned up, raising more than £100,000 and ensuring the club's survival for at least the next two months. The club's total debts were believed to be around £20 million, due to Reynolds claiming that he was owed £15 million individually. When the season came to an end, the Sterling Consortium, who had provided Darlington with that £4 million loan, took control of the club, with company director Stuart Davies becoming Darlington's new chairman. The Sterling Consortium had been founded in 2002 in an attempt to capitalise on the fall of ITV Digital, which left football with a major financial black hole. Sterling offered struggling clubs high interest loans, which they inevitably struggled to repay. Darlington weren't the only club to fall victim to Sterling's loans, they also caused major issues at Barnsley, Chesterfield and Cambridge United. Under Davies, Darlington's fortunes improved markedly on the pitch as they recorded successive 8th place finishes in League 2, only missing out on a playoff spot by virtue of goal difference in the 2004-05 season, with three teams all tied on 72 points. In 2006, following two seasons in which Davies had stabilised Darlington's performances and improved the relationship with fans without having fully addressed the club's financial difficulties, he sold the club to the property tycoon, George Hewton. An ambitious multi-millionaire named George, Hewton arrived with a five-year plan, setting off alarm bells so soon after Reynolds' reign, though his more modest plan was only for the club to be, quote, banging on the door of the championship within the next five years. Under Hewton, Darlington started spending money again, and there was even talk of a multi-million pound academy setup being built. That never materialised, and at one point, Hewton was suspended by the FA for breaching FA rules, appointing a chief executive instead of him. Things got even stranger when rumours began to circulate that Hewton was trying to buy Leeds United and Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch in California, both of which he denied. His reign ended with Darlington going back into administration in 2009 before his deputy chairman, Raj Singh, who now owns League Two side Hartlepool Town, became the club's new owner and chairman. However, during Singh's first season at the helm, Darlington lost their Football League status, with relegation to the conference. In 2011, supporters were finally given something to celebrate with a dramatic last-minute victory against Mansfield Town at Wembley Stadium in the final of the FA Vars but all the while, off-field issues dominated the talk of the town. Darlington were no strangers to sub-2,000 crowds in a 25,000-seater stadium, which looked absolutely absurd in the non-league game. And in 2012, Singh put Darlington into administration for the third time in less than a decade. This would be the last time. In May 2012, Darlington failed to agree a CVA and were expelled from the Football Association, and wound up in a high court. The club no longer existed. 
A Phoenix club was founded, but prohibited by the FA from using the same name. They called themselves Darlington 1883 instead, and started Outlife in the ninth tier of the English game. At this point, Darlington left the Reynolds Arena, by this stage, the Darlington Arena, behind, which was sold to the local rugby union club. Three promotions in four seasons secured a speedy recovery to the National League North, but Darlington are currently, somewhat ironically, unable to win promotion into the National League due to their ground not meeting league standards. They have gone from having by far the biggest stadium in the non-league game to one that isn't up to league standards. The club is owned by the fans and in 2017, they were given approval from the FA to rename themselves Darlington FC once again. When Darlington's house of cards came crashing down, so too did Reynolds and his fortune. He lost everything and was arrested on suspicion of money laundering in June 2004 when £500,000 cash was found in the boot of his car. Reynolds subsequently launched a business which manufactured and sold adult bedroom furniture, which appeared to be normal furniture to the unwitting eye, but could also be turned into a BDSM sex dungeon. That didn't last very long, since Reynolds pleaded guilty in court to charges of tax evasion and was sentenced to three years back in prison. He lost his entire fortune and spent the rest of his days living in a modest apartment in Chesterley Street, County Durham, where he ran a small e-cigarette business. In September 2019, less than two years before his death, Reynolds found himself back in court where... He was found guilty of harassment after visiting a female counsellor who refused to give him planning permission to build holiday homes at the counsellor's own home. Old habits die hard, I suppose. That is it for today's video, but thank you all as ever for watching. I know it was a long one, but I hope you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on by just hitting the little notifications bell for HITC7s. That is an ice cream van in the background, if you can hear that. You can also find me on social media, on either Twitter or Instagram, by the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so. Now I'm going to get a Cornetto.